For me, therefore, the very context of religion is to really enhance awareness, like a musician takes simple sounds, simple sounds with heightened awareness, put sounds into a harmony and creates a melody. He takes only sounds, puts it into a harmony and creates melody. It's because of his heightened awareness, so too also the context of religion should take experiences, put it into a harmony, however diverse society may be, and if we can create a melody in living, then the very context of spirituality, the context of religion, truly will seek its blessings. And therefore for me, as I was going through Whitehead, etc. in the internet, Right? It's very important how we look into the very process. How, how to look into the very process. Just to do like the process. For me, the true process is this. Some of us think, many of us think we think, and most of us never think of thinking. Though man, a thinking being is defined, how few use this grand prerogative of the mind, how few justly think of the thinking few, how many never think, but think they do. To really question the very thinking process, to really free the very thinking process, for me, is truly the process. Process work is setting the very process of thinking free. And then only we can understand the very context of religion, be it Christianity, be it Hinduism, be it Islam, be it Zen, be it whatever it is. Because, please understand friends, there is a body of religion. The problem in many of the religious conflicts is because people don't see this. There is a body of religion. Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Zen, Jainism, Sufism, Taoism. There's a body of religion which only people focus. But people fail to realize there is a mind of religion also. Not only a body of religion, there's a mind of religion. And most important, there is a very soul of religion. If you look at only the body of religion, means the tradition, as a Hindu monk, I wear satin dress. As a Catholic priest, you wear white dress. If you look at the body, a lot of references will be there. But if you go deeper into the mind of religion, if you go into the mind, then you will understand there's a meaning. For example, in India, in South India, you go to a temple, you break a coconut. You go to a temple, you bake a coconut at the altar of the Lord. The body of religion is you're breaking a coconut. And some other religion may say, what is silly to break a coconut? But if you get into the mind, of the Hindu spirit of breaking a coconut. Coconut represents ego, ahankar, and every time you break a coconut, you are reminding yourself you have to break your ego, which is hard to break. That coconut is hard to break. You have to break the ego at the altar of truth, at the altar of the Lord, and when the coconut is broken, inside sweet water comes out. Sweet water is joy, happiness. So therefore, every time the simple ritual of breaking a coconut is reminding, giving an auto-suggestion or a hetero-suggestion to yourself, A, breaking the coconut means you have to break your ego. You break your vanity. And when you break the ego in the very coconut is sweet water. And the sweet water is joy. And therefore, this is the mind of religion. In like this, in every religion, they are ritual suggestion. So therefore, if you only look at the body and not the mind, you miss it. This is, therefore, there's a body of religion, there's a mind of religion, and deeper than that, there's a very soul of religion. And if you really look into the very soul of religion, the Veda says, Ekam sak vipra bhuda vadanti. Truth is one. You can say it in different, different ways. And the soul of religion is goodness, soul of religion is love, soul of religion is true service, soul of religion is peace. And therefore, you say it in whatever, you say it is water in Tanni, Pani, Neer, Jalam, Vari in Sanskrit, it doesn't matter. Words may be different, but it's nothing but H2O. 
And therefore, it's very important to set our process free with reference to the very context of religion. Like water can be said in different, different words, but ultimately it quenches your thirst. So therefore, there's a body of religion. If we are to bring religious harmony and see, the body of religion is going to vary. But the mind of religion gives you a deeper anchorage and there's a very soul of religion. And if you read, read this, see the soul of religion, you will set the process of your mind free. For me, very important is set our thinking process itself free to understand the context. I like to say this through an example. It seems there was in a college, a beautiful college in this. All right, it seems the chief guest of the place was an old uh, student there and he was a world chess champion. He was invited into the college to give an inaugural address. And therefore, you being a world champion, the principal and all the staff were very felt honored. This person, world chess champion, has studied from our school. So therefore, they made sure every arrangement is free. When this world best chess champion, the old student of the school, it seems comes into the school. And as he comes, looks at the building and says, same old building. And the principal and all, they get confused what to do. Then he comes into the auditorium. The world chess champion has become a big guy and he looks at the auditorium, not this auditorium, this is a wonderful auditorium. <laughs> he looks at the auditorium of the school, he says, same old auditorium. He looks at the ground, same old ground. Looks at the building, same old. And then he tells the principal, I want to go to my hostel and room number 25. All right, and then, then the principal tells the secretary, make sure room number 25 hostel is clean. Right? Now this man goes, same old hostel. The secretary rushes to, rushes to room number 25. Right? And it's a boy's hostel. And room number 25, boy's hostel, a boy is having an affair with a girl. <laughs> My God, the secretary says, the principal is coming and the chief guest is coming there. What is that you're doing? Right? Now what to do? They are coming the corridor. So this secretary says, okay, the cupboards are huge here. Tell the girl to hide inside the cupboard. <laughs> so therefore, the world chess champion, old school boy, he comes, same old hostel. He goes into room number 25, same old room. He enters in the room, looks at the bed, same old bed. Looks at the cupboard, same old cupboard. Opens the cupboard and says, same old girl. <laughs> <laughs> this mindset one has to free oneself from. For me, I look at process as if you don't, you know, look at this guy, comes after 25 years of school and says, same old, same old, same old, same old, same old. If your mind cannot see the new in the old, that mind is a dead mind. It is the same sun rising, even though it is the same sun rising, every time the sun rises, it has this dance of elegance, it has its own poetry of the moment. If you have a mind which is not free, and I mean process, is processing your mind so it is free, so that when you read the Bible each time, it should give you a new meaning. When you read the Gita each time, it should give you a new meaning. When you look at the sun rising each time, it should give you a new meaning. When you look at your wife each time, it should be a beautiful wife or a same old wife. <laughs> Please see, it is this sick mind that we have to surrender, transform. In Sanskrit we say, prakshalanam karaniyam asmavi. For me, process, the process work is all great people be it Buddha, Krishna, Aurobindo, Mahavira, we're setting the mind free. As the great saint in India called Kabir, he says, Man ke haar haar hai, man ke jeet jeet. If your mind is, feels it is lost, it is lost, it is lost. Your mind says, one, you're one. It is this mind, says the Veda, an ancient text in the Veda, which says, Manaha yeva manushyana karanam bandha moksha yo. Your mind is the cause for your bandha, your bondage. Your mind is your cause for your moksha, your freedom. This mind has to be set free. For me, process work is all great masters. 
be Buddha, Krishna, everybody is setting the mind free. When you set your mind free, the ability to see the new, you will see. If you can see the new in the old, you will start seeing elegance in imperfection in life. Like a musician, same raw, same raw each time. Right? Hari Prasad Chaurasya sings the same ra, same person, same flute, same ra. But each time a musician sings the same ra, ra means musical note. Every time he sings the same note, same flute, same person, but something new opens up. Unless we set our consciousness free like this, please understand, please see, the true process work doesn't really happen. For me, second, setting the mind free. I take this as a part of process. Is setting the mind free. Is also setting the mind free from conclusions, dogmatic conclusions. I have traveled throughout the world. I've addressed inter-religious forums. I've met different, different people. Right? I've seen people form conclusions, and then they don't see. It is conclusions alone see. Right? They don't see. It's only conclusion see. And therefore, where is seeing? That's why Indian philosophy is called as Darshan Shastra. Darshan means seeing. Darshan means seeing. And Buddha is to say, Iho is to say, Iho means come, Pasiko means see. I only teach you the art of seeing. Buddha says, his famous statement, Iho Pasiko, come, I will teach, see how to make you see, he says, because we see through conclusions. I like to, I like to highlight through an example. It seems, you know, right, a Chinese gets into a, a, a forum in, in America, a Chinese gets into an American forum there, and dinner was there, so this Chinese sat, sat down next to an American guy, the American person felt this Chinese does not know English, and therefore what he does is, when he's taking this soup, he says, do you like the soupy? <laughs> Chinese tend to drag, so is he like the soupy? And this Chinese shook his head. And the person was eating fish, he said, the American said to the Chinese, do you like the fishy? The person shook his head. Then he was eating rice. He said, do you like the ricey? Assuming this person does not know English, he went on saying he should. At the end, after dinner, the main speaker was this Chinese guy. And he was supposed to talk on Shakespearean English. <laughs> he spoke so beautiful. The American guy said, my God, I assume too fast. That's why I always say, be careful of assume. Assume means you make an ass of you and me. <laughs> assume, all right? This person assume. This person assume. So of the whole beautiful Shakespeare English, right, this Chinese finishes a speech, goes down to the American and says, do you like my speechy? <laughs> Please understand, I'm seeing through an example, we form conclusions. And from conclusions, we look at life. You form a conclusion, oh, all right, the Gita is not good. All right, and then somebody reads the Gita, you will start finding what you want to find. You form a conclusion, oh, Bible is not good. And then a person reads the Bible, he will get what he looks for, because you get what you focus. So therefore, please understand, even the process to understand even religion is, you have to drop your conclusions and set your perceptions free. And you drop your conclusions, set your perception free, then a certain processing will happen. And the context of religion is to set your soul free. The context of religion, please see, whatever religion, is to set your soul free. But if you don't keep the very thinking process free, <coughs> your soul is not going to be free. And therefore, we find in the name of religion, people are getting more and more conditioned, conditioned, conditioned. And if you are more and more conditioned, where are you free? So condition should drop. A process should drop your condition and you should be a free soul to look at it. I'll share my own experience. I, I come from an orthodox Hindu house, family, and my first trip was to Australia. My first trip was to Australia. 
I had been in Blue Mountains, I was taking a workshop. I, come from, I was hardly about 26, 27 years there. And I, I had all the local Australians, I was taking a workshop. At the end of my workshop, a beautiful looking hostess of mine, she came to me and said, Swamiji, the seminar was so good, your workshop was so good, and she felt so happy, and she hugged me and kissed me on my cheeks. I felt very uncomfortable. <laughs> Because I'm used to, as a Hindu mom, people touching my feet. She decided why go low, she went high. <laughs> she thought why dirty pasture, she went to cleaner pastures. <laughs> but I felt very uncomfortable, it was a real experience, I'm confessing. I felt very uncomfortable. From Blue Mountains in Australia, then I went to Sydney, and I was staying in a German couple's house. And I told the German couple, I felt very uncomfortable. She kissed me on my cheeks. And he told me, Swamiji, why should you feel uncomfortable? She's so good looking. <laughs> I got another shock. <laughs> See, a simple act of hugging and kissing, I felt very uncomfortable. It is not the hug and kiss. It is my conditioning as a Hindu mom. All right? And it is that conditioning which has made it very unpleasant. So therefore, please, please look into it. If our process of our thinking, if spirituality, religion doesn't set our thinking free, it doesn't free our soul. That's why I like White Alfred White Peter is going through the internet. He was saying it is a it is a process of becoming. Reality is it is becoming. Because if this whole process of thing it should be a becoming process, not a static process. If, if, if religion doesn't help me to process my thinking free, my conclusions drop, seeing things freely inwardly, right? dropping all concepts and images. You know, we form concepts and images, and afterwards, we can never look at a person. I've addressed so many corporate workshops in India, and even abroad. When I take now a corporate management, first thing they see me with the dhoti and things, hey, what, has he, what can he talk about management? All right, so you form a conclusion. And the moment you form a conclusion, you can never see a person freely. I studied in, ba in Baldwin's in Bangalore. After becoming a monk, I was playing a basketball. I continued playing basketball in the Indian Institute of Agriculture College. One of my students saw me play, playing basketball, and he was so upset. At the end of it, he came to me and said, Pranam Swamiji, Pranam, Swamiji, I'm very hurt. I asked him why? Because you are playing basketball. <laughs> I said, if I'm playing basketball, it means what? I'm playing basketball. Which means what? I'm playing basketball. <laughs> Which means what? I'm playing basketball. But he said, as Swamiji's, you should not play basketball. I said, who said that? <laughs> he said, from Lord Krishna times, monks were not playing basketball. He said. <laughs> because I talk on Lord Krishna's, on Bhagavad Gita. He said, what can I talk? Lord Krishna times, there were no balls. <laughs> of playing basketball is creating conflict in somebody. <laughs> Please understand. He's creating conflict in somebody. So if religion is creating conflict, it is not religion which is creating conflict. It's people's mindsets, people's conditionings, people's dogmatic perceptions, people this one, which is creating conflict in religion. Because you don't look at the very soul of religion, you get lost in the body of religion. Let us respect the body, respect the mind, respect the soul, and you can, you can choose whatever you want. But instead of doing this, we are busy telling somebody is wrong, somebody is wrong, and we are busy telling somebody is wrong, this religion is wrong, that religion is wrong, this philosophy is wrong, that philosophy is wrong. We are busy settling scores. And when we are busy settling scores, what happens? Instead of seeing the context of religion to transform and set your mind free, the very context itself becomes an imprisoning point. 
and therefore for me process is it. this process work for me all great masters be it buddha krishna are setting our mind free because first this mind has to be free and when the mind is free we'll be free enough to read be it bhagavad gita be it the quran be it the bible be it the dhammapada we'll be free there and once when that is there a different understanding opens up for me the conflict has happened in society in the name of religion also is because of these process work not being really free in the indian thought and in my part of a little research i like to share right the mind which is a victim of certain patterns in the hindu thought we call it samskaras if your mind has got samskara certain patterns and if you don't release those patterns now you will find you are inwardly not free to understand the very context of religion and the four patterns in my research based in indian thought primarily is we i just put it in english and avoiding sanskrit first is called if your mind has a pattern called bidala cat pattern it's called samskaras therefore hindu goes to shodasha samskaras 16 samskaras to set your mind free one is called cat pattern if you have a cat pattern in you you know cat pattern means it's you very indifferent you know in my ashram i love dogs i love cats at dogs and cats after i go for a tour i come back you can see my both labor dogs jump on me lick on me kiss on me whereas the cat just looks at me and goes and whenever it wants to get rubbed it will come all right so cat pattern in in thought means kind of indifferent have you seen some people very indifferent i have said taking so many talks there and especially in it industries when i crack a joke you know people hardly laugh on me they study my software and hardware but they won't laugh when i say marketing people i crack a joke before my joke it's over they laugh <laughs> all right so you no know, because they being the computer computer people become very indifferent so a person has a cat pattern indifferent best of jokes you crack also huh, a dysentery <laughs> come constipated look <laughs> smiling is giving income tax to the government <laughs> that type of look is there <laughs> You see, it is because please understand the psychology. They have a cat pattern. I'm not condemning a cat. Means an indifferent. That's why my book has given a beautiful example. A cat and a dog as a dialogue. A cat and a dog as dialogue. The dog says, "I'm so lucky. My master is God." Says the dog to the cat. My master takes me for a walk. Master gives me biscuits. master taking to a doctor master gives me bath he does so much to me i think the dog tells the cat my master is god the cat says to the dog my master also takes me for a walk my master also gives haircut my master also gives me biscuits to eat i think i am god <laughs> because so much the master is doing to me same thing the dog feels this one now if a person has a cat pattern this is the pattern now unless you set your mind free of cat pattern you can never see god dancing in the poor god residing in the poverty seeking god residing in and through as whitehead says that that permanence in the changing says <laughs> 